it's literally just a matter of outlasting all the failures like over time it's like you're stepping on every failure as a lesson welcome back to the journey podcast i'm your co-host emma jackson and i'm jose and today we are joined by the amazing jonathan lewis Thank you for joining us today. Thank y'all for having me. I appreciate me. y'all coming in. Yeah. Jonathan Lewis is a Houston native and the founder of Jet Quest Travel Club, a luxury travel platform that is redesigning the experience of group travel. Mm -hmm. Their mission is to inspire, educate, and lead people through travel to become their best selves. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, some so research. before we get into Jet Quest, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, I'm from Houston, Texas, born and raised, um, played basketball my whole life. That's what I always thought was going to be like, you know, the thing that college got me. Ball? Yeah, played college ball. Nice. Uh, you can Google me, actually. Um, my stats are amazing. Like, <laughs> Wait, Division <laughs> One or? I, it was Division Two going into Division One. So, like, literally the year I went, we were upgrading to Division One. So, like, we didn't, we couldn't go to the playoffs. I was going to make a joke, though, about my stats. Like, my <laughs> stats are actually not amazing <laughs> <laughs> on there. So, I did not play a lot. The coach who recruited me actually, like, left and brought in a bunch of players with him. That was all, like, 23. I'm, like, 19. So, I, I got no playing time. But um, I dropped out of school early and started into the hospitality industry and to travel and started, uh, you know, my entrepreneur journey um, at about 21. And I was with the company based out of Dallas. I learned so much. I got a lot of mentors. I understood or I learned structure of corp a company that was doing billions of revenue. I saw systems. I met, you know, people from all different countries. And so that really got me sparked into travel and kind of, you know, where we are now. Was that your first experience with travel when you actually worked yeah, for the company? Yeah, my family never traveled out of the country. Um, I didn't have a passport until I was 21. Um, so, yeah, no, 100%. And Even, how did you decide you, like, loved travel? I didn't decide. I just I, <laughs> I realized <laughs> when, I got to, when I got to Mexico for the first time, that was my first trip out of the country. I think we did a, a cruise. So the company I was with, one of the ways they sold me is they were offering, like, $69 cruises at the time. And so I was like, that shit makes a lot of sense, <laughs> you know? So um, when I was involved, we took one. And, I mean, yeah, like I said, I just realized while out of the country, like, it was just a dopamine hit. You know, I grew up, even in college, before I started traveling, like, I'm the kind of person who I was always road tripping. Like, I'm going to Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, San Marcos, you know, being in Houston. So we're all around in Texas because I just, I can't sit still. You know, I was always searching for... I don't want to say, like, I was always looking for fun, you know? Always just trying to explore, curious, all that type of thing. So travel really gives you that on a way different scale. Completely agree. Yeah. I, I was able to tell, say I'm a huge travel fan, and I have been, like, pushing... I actually inspired Jose to get his passport. You didn't have it? I didn't yeah. have it until like 30 years old. Oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> welcome to the club. Yes. You got the Patagonia on, too. That's like a travel brand, kind of outdoor travel mm -hmm. style brand. She also got me on that, too. So you're just yeah. putting him on. Yeah, 100%. Well, the thing <laughs> is, it's like, because I, it was college for me. So I got to, okay. I got all these opportunities. I went to a school that was very into um, study abroad. And okay. shout out Center College. And yeah, they provided a ton of funds so that every student had the ability to go and do a semester abroad so if the they wanted to. school pay for that? School paid for it. Regular, it was like regular tuition. So if you had scholarships or whatever, it was total. Everything was covered. I didn't know, but a lot of schools, it's really expensive to study abroad and do something extra. And they make it super accessible. On top of that, there were all these grants and scholarships. So I got to go... Let's see, I studied abroad in France. I got to travel all around. Wait, hold on, hold on. What school is this again? Center College. It's a small liberal arts college in Kentucky, because I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> and they, but they have like 50% of the kids that crazy, go there right? Right. are from Kentucky? out of state or international. Is this a big school? It's small. It's small. Like a little private? It's a little private liberal arts college. Okay. And they are, um, honestly, they do a really good job at bringing people in from all over the U.S., from all over the world. That makes sense. I'm like, this is not no regular university we're talking about. <laughs> like, this, is, this is some very specialized shit that we're talking about. That and they really, they love, like, it was, for me, it was the travel opportunities for sure. Yeah. And so I, I ended up getting a grant to study in, I let's see, I studied in France. I got to go to Eastern Europe on this, like, choir tour. I lived and worked in Thailand on a fully on a grant from the school. 
So I got to go like all over. And then when I graduated, I was like, hmm, it is a lot harder to travel now that I'm not being paid to do it. I didn't know it was this much money because everything (laughs) was free. (laughs) And so all of a sudden it was like, okay, this is a huge passion of mine. How the heck am I going to leave my lifestyle in and my career into travel? Yeah, you got to get involved in that thing we call capitalism. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But hey, Jose, I mean, you're one to attest. I convinced last year in January, I said, why don't we all, we've been grinding and hustling. Mm -hmm. What happens if we take our executive team and we go to Costa Rica for like a week and we work and because I, w- I had done a lot of remote work Yo, and travel triple production is what you will do yeah and what did, tell me about your experience in Costa Rica Jose man honestly it was just fun it was a uh, it was altering my not in a sense that yeah you saw a different place in the world you'd never see I'm from the US I did travel a little bit with the army but going to Costa Rica is one of the most beautiful beaches I've ever seen in my life yeah and it kind of opened my mind to like explore more from there, I went to Puerto Rico. I lived in Puerto Rico for almost a year, and it was that was your Costa Rico was your first trip out of the country, mm-hmm. first oh, yeah. trip out of the country. Yeah, did you feel like you learned or like explored or felt new things about yourself too? Yeah, and how the world is different. Like in America, we're so focused on like the hustle, the grind, let's get paid, the bigger car. I mean, the the better car, the bigger house. And then Costa Rica they didn't really care about that. It was more about just kind of like the vibe of living, traveling, nature. Uh, Puerto Rico is the same way. They don't care how much money you make or what you do for as a profession, it's like, oh, you want to go to the beach? You want to have just dance in the square? Did you see a lot of people who had, like, food in their backyard type of deal? Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. And it was yeah. the kind of place you could just, like, pick fruit off the trees and eat yeah, it. Yeah, life you know? is a lot different when, like, you you don't think about eating because there's a pear tree, banana tree, and a peach tree, and a mango tree in your backyard, you know? like it just, yeah. And then you got, like, a couple chickens, and, like, technically, you're you're poor, but you have everything you need in your backyard type of deal. Uh, it's just a different, it's a different standard. Like you said, yeah, that'll expose you. Um, it'll just open your mind. You know, you see just different ways. I remember being in Jamaica. We were at an Airbnb, me and my brother. This was his first time out the country. And we stayed at a place where they had like eight fruit trees in the backyard. And we just really, you know, I sat with my brother. He's like, yo, you know, I, I just really thought today. And this is like me. I'm a conspiracy <laughs> theorist. But, you know, I've had these thoughts since I was like 10. He's like, I just thought like, why? do we never have trees with fruit in America anywhere? And I'm like, da. Oh, no, I think the same thing. I'm like, yeah, what are they trying to do? They're like, yeah, man, it's like that that uh, viral Orlando Bloom video. He's like, you're trying to make us pay for fruits. Yes. For apples and things that God gave us for free. But it's it's the real deal, you know? Like, you you know, it, it's, a, it's a business. So, you know, like I said, if all that stuff was for free in your backyard, it would be a lot harder to sell um, the produce aisle in the grocery store. 100%. But, so, okay, you never had really experienced travel. Then you start, you land in this hospitality travel job, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, oh, this is a big passion of mine. Yeah, yeah, it was a mix of, so within that company, I, I became a leader really quick, um, you know. Who was your role? Uh, I was a marketing director. So Which I had a, a team under me of about four, 500 people at the height. Um, so I, I was learning personal development skills. I had mentors of my own. Uh, I took about 30 trips with that company. So all this time, I'm in a a whirlwind of being mentored, being a part of a very productive, entrepreneurial environment, traveling, experiencing new things amongst myself, having to motivate other people whose mindsets are like slightly undermined because they're joining new or coming into that. So this is all like a four year time span where it was just like fast growth, learning um, and, and building a system. So, like I said, that company reached billions in revenue. And so I got to see the culture, the systems and the infrastructure of a business that gets that big in travel in particular. Um, but I also saw a lot of things that I've always felt that they were missing. Um, and it wasn't a lot, but there were some few things that I always thought was key. Like, you know, if you couldn't. If you were not a member of that club, you couldn't come on some of these trips. Like unless, and I just thought that was dumb because the retention rate was so high for people who took a trip, they almost never left the club. So I'm like, why wouldn't you just offer that maybe at a a premium, like a a non-member price so you could get people who weren't members to experience it and then stay? That's a really good idea. To me, that was common sense, Mm -hmm. even back then. Like I didn't know, I didn't even know the word retention, but I was explaining that to people like, why don't we, why don't we do this? And so things like that, um, you know, like right now everybody has an affiliate program for everything, you know, even the grocery stores have affiliate programs for shit now. But (laughs) at the time I was like, everybody doesn't want to do direct sales, but everybody 
if they're taking a trip with two or three of their friends, wouldn't mind sharing their code oh, to yeah. get a discount off. So just taking a lot of the pressure to feel like, oh, I'm a, a employee or a salesperson. I'm just coming to experience it. If y'all come to, I'll get a little benefit. Um, but just adding certain things and a lot of stuff on the back end. Um, and then you got like <clears throat> blockchain, which protects a lot of transactions, obviously. One thing that really, really was big was the company had, I'm not even going to go into detail about it, but the company basically had a major, major financial setback caused by not paying attention to details and some people in China found a way to like game the system. So they lost lots of money, ended up going bankrupt in a matter of like two or three years. So wow. you went from top of the top, you're like leading, you know, 500 plus people, you're, you're just traveling all over the world to, holy cow, this company just went It was bankrupt. literally one day when uh, I was supposed to get a check and um, like, I'm talking about four years, never ever got a check late, not once. I'm talking about the time they said it might've came early some days. And then one day, like, no check and i'm calling people like what's uh what's going on they're like oh don't worry you know trying to um what's the gaslight me and I, oh no it's don't worry man it's like i'm like don't worry bro we've been this getting checks so on time for four years <laughs> <laughs> you know, like yeah. never of course i'm worried so you know and that that's from there it just the more and more bs was happening so long story short i had about a year and a half time in between that starting to happen and figuring out what I was going to do, I just really got deep into marketing, more hospitality, um, worked with a lot of restaurants, um, clubs, different hotels, cruise lines, got into uh, content creation a lot harder. And about a year later, like I said, I really came up with the idea for JetQuest, thanks to a friend of mine named um, Cedric. So Cedric, he was living abroad in Malaysia at the time. So it was super dope because I'd never seen a black person who was just living abroad. Like he was the first person who I knew who was like 20 something living in Malaysia in a high rise for like $800 a month, you know, and just explaining to me how cheap it was, but he was living so luxurious. But at the same time, it was like on weekends, cause he worked a job out there teaching uh, Malaysian kids English. But on the weekends he would go to like a close island and hang out with monks or he would go to the Philippines and it was just, it just looked so amazing. Anyway, fast forward, he was like, let's do a trip together. And I'm like, nah, that's a good idea. He showed me the place we wanted to go to. And um, I was like, yeah, let's put it together. So we put this trip to Thailand together. Um, he did majority of the, the communication with the hotel and the work and setting everything up. I invited about half the people. And, you know, long story short, we were gonna go into business. He ended up like, you know, he wanted a different name. I wanted a different name. He had a couple partners that he wanted to go in with. I didn't want to go in with those partners. So I still supported everything he was doing and vice versa. I was just like, let's just, you know, do our own. But I still, like, we can still do collabs as many times as we want. Um, but oh. he definitely was a catalyst for that. So how long has your company been open now? Since, so I say three years, but 2019 is when we started at the end of 2019. Um, how was that with the pandemic and stuff? I was about to get into that. So <laughs> um, after 2019, we had like, you know, we just did two really solid trips. First one was 45 people. Next one was 100. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, so like very... Those are big group trips. Very big, very big. A lot of stress. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, so we had so much hype. Like I was so excited for 2020. Like we were like planned out for about 10 trips. We was like, yo, we're going to do a half a million dollar revenue year minimum. Um and then COVID hits to start the year. And so just had to pivot really fast, obviously, figuring out ways to, you know, because I had ended up leaving my job because we had projections for all this this money we was about to make. And I'm like, I'm going all in, which I've always been a go all in type of person. So, Facts. yeah, it just was a, a huge setback. But at the same time, we were still able to do like a, it wasn't an official trip, but we, we did some trips for content um, with the people who were brave enough to go out the country during COVID in 2020. Um, and I just figured out some ways to just stay afloat for 2020. And um, 2021, we bounced back really hard. We had five trips that year. And uh, it, it was just like, it's dope to me because we can really say, we figured a way to keep a travel company alive during a world shutdown. And not just alive, but we really thrived that year. You know, we really growed our social media, you know, a, a huge amount. We, we had over, 200 people traveled with us that year um, with a very small team. And so, yeah, it's just like you got to – there's always an opportunity amongst the chaos. 
Yeah. You know, I think there's an advantage to having to start a business. It, there's there's research that shows that if you start a business <laughs> in a recession, if you start a business in a crisis period of time and you're able to get through that, you are going to be so much stronger because you have learned to operate in a very lean way under the craziest of circumstances. Yeah. It's totally different than when investors are just like handing out money Throwing to any money and to everyone, everybody. you know, and everyone's just buying stuff because they got all this extra money, right? Yeah, yeah. And no. now you're like... I don't have anything to worry about because I've been through like COVID. Like we're fine. A hundred percent. No, I mean it's the same thing. Like I was reading Fifty Cent's book and it talks Get about train? Hmm? Get Rich or Die Trying. Is that the name? No. Or the Fifty Laws. Yeah. Power. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was like, did he make a book saying that? That's the movie. <laughs> <It's> the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I watched that too. But no, he was just talking about you know how the fear that he doesn't really have that he was able to overcome. Like he takes that into the business world because he got. You know, he got shot nine times, so like that's like about as bad as it gets, right? Well, it, it's a real thing in 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 just life, like going through that shutdown of the world and like possibly having to shut your business down and like not being able to do, you know, these huge plans we had for a whole year, um, but still figuring it out. Like you said, I mean, just two years before COVID, like you said, everybody's getting money from every direction, venture capital wise. People were coming up with ideas and getting funding like two days later type stuff. Yeah, when they did not have a secure plan. No real <laughs> plan. On investment. BS projections, you know, just <laughs> it, throw something at the wall. But um, yeah, I, I think 100% it's prepared us to like really have a legitimate long term business. How many, how many trips are you planning this year? This year, uh, we're looking at doing four out the country and then four in the country. So we haven't really done a lot of domestic events or trips. So I wanted to really start tapping into that more this what year. What does one of like, this event look like? Like, what are you planning for your guests? Just like a regular trip? Yeah, like a regular trip. Uh, So, let's just let's just say uh, Egypt, for example. So, and this is kind of every trip, but, you know, the person books, they are in it to a group chat, they are able to start communicating and connecting with the people who are also going on the trip. So, everybody, by the time they land, is like, cool, they've been talking shit. Some of the girls and guys have probably been flirting with each other already by that time. Um, everybody's getting picked up from the airport, taken to the hotel. We usually have a separate check-in from the normal guests. Um, food excursions are included. We have a host. There's security included. Like when we were in Egypt, we had a security guard who, you know, he wore a suit every day in 100-degree heat with an Uzi under his jacket. You know, so that was our <laughs> security with us everywhere we went. I was like, bro, you're not hot? <laughs> like, I, I'm I'm sweating bullets. I mean, he might be hot. Now he like, he was cool know. as a fan though on the outside somehow. <laughs> but um yeah, so like I said, security um and then the full itinerary is already explained to everybody before they even book. So people just come and it's like the thought process of traveling it was taken away from them and it's just they can just enjoy the moment experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just come and enjoy the moment. Um and yeah, so. They know what they're getting, and the experience is always going to be a little bit better just because they don't have to think. They don't have to pull out their wallets every time we go and stop at a place. Um, and then it's the networking thing. Because there's a lot of people who, like, maybe money is not a problem. Time might not be a problem. But, like, maybe money and time can be a problem for everybody that you would want to travel with. Um, you know, I talk to a lot of people, especially women, like, they're like, oh, I didn't have nobody to travel with, and I just don't want to go alone because it might not be safe. Well, we have so many women who come on our trips for that exact reason. You know, they don't have a girlfriend who can travel. Maybe they got kids or they got work, whatever. But they come on our trips safe, but at the same time, they can come solo. How long are the trips? It depends. So, like, even right now, um, our average trip that we've done so far is, like, four to five days. So we do some six, seven, eight days. Um, like, when we do Kenya and Dubai, those are going to be so seven-day cool. trips. Kenya might be eight. Um, I think you already got her solo. Well, I mean, okay, so I'm a huge solo traveler, but it came out of necessity, right? So okay. I did not have anyone in my She's life. She's like a super traveler, though. No, so I she started I, in college. <laughs> like, it was an educated traveler. I know, educated, but I had no, like... We went to the museum yesterday, was, and she was just telling me, this This is from this time period, this place. I, um, you, should have, you should have recorded her and put her on TikTok. Like, when, you're, when your friends show off at, at the museum, your, tra your traveling friend. No, I just had to take yeah. so many art history classes, and I was like, okay, I guess something stuck. No, that's I was like, I like but, music. She's but, like, like, the thing is, I, okay, I love my friends to death, mm. but they are homebodies, and I have never been that way. No. And I had this realization that I was like, damn, if I don't do this on my own, I'm never going to go. I'm going to be sitting around waiting for someone to want to go with me. Yeah. And I didn't, like, no, I didn't know that group trip situations exist, and I don't think they did when I first started. Not like this. There's, there's only a few, like, you got, um... 
I'm not gonna mention their names. <laughs> well, no, because I'm usually thinking, group I'm travel. About one company that does that. Well, usually group yeah, travel yeah, is like. Yeah, I don't know their name. It's like they have the blue banners. And like, which... That was the company I was talking yeah. about. Oh, for real? Yeah, but, so but they I, don't time, exist anymore. Though. That's what I'm saying. And every time I encountered mm. a group trip travel, it was like you have to bring the group. And I was like, like you, like they will book a group trip for uh. you, but you have to bring the group. And I was like, no, 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 this is not the thing. I need people. I need yeah. people to go with. Yeah. And you're saying I want to create this community. So not only are we gonna take care of everything for you, but we're gonna like that to me sounds way more interesting. We're cultivating the communities so yeah. that you can come and meet people, you can network and get out of like whatever your normal circle is. Because really, the there's a everything has a few problems. Travel is not any different from that. So like the main problems are a lot of times like time, money, not having people, not knowing what to do, um, like the research of it, the stress of research. Like research for travel sucks, <laughs> especially like places that you don't know. Like it's easy to okay, we're gonna do Mexico real quick. It's two hour flight. You know, everybody goes to Cancun. It's the same street, 20 hotels. Like, let's pick one. But, you know, going to Nigeria for the first time and you don't know anything about Nigeria or Cameroon or Bali, if you don't know, you don't know. So it's an amount of research when it comes to food, uh, getting picked up from the airport, what places are safe and what's not safe. Go on TikTok. You got that now. So it's just a bunch of shit. So we take all of that off of the plate for you. And the bigger our brand gets, obviously, it's all about people, you know, actually trusting the brand. Obviously, we got lots of content. We've done lots of trips. So that builds the trust. It was like Apple or even Celsius. If they drop a flavor, you know it's not, you know when you drink it, it's not going to taste like shit at least because you trust the brand, right? So as people trust the brand, they trust our research that we put two and two together and did our due diligence for this trip. And on top of that, they know they're going to meet a dope type of person. Master's question, where do you want to see the company in? Like, 10 years from now, where you... I want to be the biggest travel club in the world and the first ever travel curation engine. So you got companies like, perfect example, Uber. Uber created their own industry. Do y'all know what that industry is? I mean, they took over the taxi industry and they kind of changed it up. Right. What's the name they gave it? Rideshare. Uh, Rideshare. Rideshare wasn't an industry. It wasn't a thing before Uber. But now you have... Uh, Lyft, Lyft um, they have Alto, they got like a, a bunch of different DD companies. DD over in other places in the world, there's, yeah, like people yeah. all over the world are how, yeah. trying to replicate what Uber did. When you travel, yeah, exactly, there's other companies that don't exist in America that are like ride shares for Malaysia, ride shares for Asia, whatever. So they created their own industry. Uh, I think we're going to do the same thing because obviously there's a lot of group travel companies, but I don't think any of them are going about it the way we are. Um, you know, you have a lot of people who are way better content creators than me and can probably fill out a trip, but they don't know anything about tech, venture capital, or business infrastructure. They can just fill up a trip. You have a lot of people on the other side. They're venture capital tech guys, but they don't know shit about travel. Um, and I've got experience in all of those areas, and I feel like I'm also amazing at putting teams together and kind of painting a vision for people. So I, I, I think to myself, like, if anybody could do this, you so, got to be one of the like less than eight people on the planet who could do this type of company and actually make it become as big as you want. So that's just what the focus is. Like that's the exact goal. That's what we're gonna do. That is so cool. I heard on your Instagram, I did a little bit of research that you all are in the process of developing an app. What would that look like? Because right now you go to your website and it's pretty simple. It's like, hey, yeah. sign up for a trip. Here's the trips we got going on. It's just a marketplace basically right yeah. now. Like you got the trips, you got clothes on there you could just book them so what would that app look like what would that experience be yeah so really what we're wanting to do is cultivate the community like we're talking about so like you're saying you know you can go to these other platforms and they're like yeah bring the group and we'll put everything together for you but it's like nah like i want the experience with the group and the community too like everything right now is is how much more convenient can you make anything for humans? That type of business will always sell. And then community and making something feel exclusive. Those type of things will always sell. So you're so, hitting on both of those. You're exactly. saying we're going to make it as convenient as possible and we're also going to bring the community together. Yeah. You guys, have you thought about um, like virtual reality and how that's going to impact the travel industry? Hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more. Uh, I mean, I mean Apple, it's, like that, the whole... Yeah. It, exactly. So I, I knew, um, what was it? So the company I was with, they had their own version of an app and they had 360 videos. So this is before AI and virtual reality was even a thing. This is like 2015 and 16, but this is like the 360 video. And so they had maybe, I don't know, 
30 to 50 videos of locations that they had trips to. So you could see kind of like a 30 second clip of what each day would kind of look like. So if we were going to like um, visit this museum, there was a 30 second clip of basically they had somebody go out there and do a 360 degree video walk through with that place. And that was so dope. We would just be watching and like that shit felt like virtual reality in 2015. Yeah. But I'm just like, okay, virtuality is actually coming. And then like a year and a half later, Apple announced that they were about to do Vision Pro. Mm -hmm. So and it took them like another two years to finally drop that shit. But that's great. We wanted them to postpone it as long as possible so we could really be around the same time dropping this type of stuff. I also think that that will benefit you long term. So I don't know if you heard yesterday. Was it yesterday or the day before OpenAI? Uh, announced that now they're doing artificial um, video, videos. text to video, text wild to video. animation. Have y'all seen some of those videos? Yes, yes. they look freaking. Yeah, they're some so of them detailed. You can't tell. I, I seen one. It was like, it was a half of a lady's face and just like a zoom in on her eye. You cannot tell that that's not that's cool. a real my, person. My brain goes like, you kind of can show the people the potential experience through like a AI video of what they're gonna see in that particular place because it takes from actual, like. Data Did from real stuff. Exactly. Yeah. No, hundred percent. Um, and there's a specific way that we already had in mind of how we're going to collect this info and how resorts and hotels would want this kind of like a Google listing, but virtually uh, a virtual experience of it. But like you said, with this AI now, that cuts the possible cost of doing that. It, it just it just really changed the game. Like we could have them send us a hundred pictures of their rooms and their uh. Um, I not itinerary uh, amenities and the AI can actually create a video mm -hmm. based off of just those pictures of the whole property and then include people experiencing shit in those videos exactly so I saw a video not so long ago with a YouTuber kind of reviewing the Vision Pros and he was doing a review of the F1 race and how the race is actually going to be displayed on the Vision Pro mm -hmm. he could actually physically walk through like a little room was he on the treadmill? in the treadmill yeah you oh. saw it? No, I was asking. Yeah, yeah. so he <laughs> physically walk. The cameras, like the gyroscope and the camera was kept pushing through. So he was experiencing uh, the what he's going to see in the F1 race, like how the mm. car is going to navigate the track and stuff like that. He was like, pretty much experiencing the race from a different perspective. Yeah. So NBA like, just did that too. Like they just announced and showed like a, a demo of that. Like uh, basically they have a, a couple different ways. Like one of them was like I saw cartoon version so it might have like a, a one or two second lag but like while the game is happening all the cameras are feeding into the ai and it's like now it looks like the spider-man into the unit the the spider-verse movie but it's the live feed of what's happening in the game yeah it was crazy I'm that like, is wild it is and, wild. and meta's too said so meta's a little bit more advanced than apple on like kind of like the characters or like uh the avatars mm -hmm. they look way more realistic it wins apple kind of really hones in on the avatars, I think Apple's going to be killing the game because it's, you're not going to see that cartoon feature anymore. Yeah. You're going to actually see, like, real people. Yeah. No, it's it's uh, it's amazing and scary from conspiracy version of me <laughs> yeah. um, at the same time. But I mean, I think, I think it's going to benefit you. I think if you could show people the experience before they actually go on the trip. Yeah. No, 100%. We're, we're going to utilize it. And like I said, I feel like like we're talking about this in here, but y'all have to remember so many of the people, like, the majority of the world still is going to be 100% late on everything we're talking about, mm -hmm. especially I'm talking about just consuming it like but the people who are producing right now, obviously, you got Apple and companies like that, like they've been planning this. There's a video of Steve Jobs talking about Vision Pro basically like in 2006 or something like that. 2003. He was a visionary. Uh, crazy. Right. Um, but. You know, even still, if you're working on a business, you should be trying to figure out exactly how you can triple and quadruple up using AI um, and virtual reality. That and I is. love that. You don't see it as competition because I'm going to be honest. I think a lot of experience based companies have been pushing back against, you know, oh, that's, that's just a you fear. know, virtual reality, AR. Like, we, you know, we don't want anything to do with that because the thing is, A, that's coming through and B, you and I know that that's not going to stop people from wanting in-person experiences. It's right. going to be a combination. And so if you can figure out how to harness that desire, that you're just creating a better user experience. Right. I mean, uh, somewhat of an analogy is like, look at Fashion Nova. Like, they changed the game of, like, shopping and made it, like, strictly online as far as fast shopping and stuff like that. Um, and damn near ran 21, what's it called? Forever 21 out of business. And mm -hmm. then they started putting stores in, but they did it the reverse way. So <laughs> yeah. it's like, I feel like it's the same thing. You can't, you can't replicate going to Bali or touching the Taj Mahal. 
you can get a second, a close second with the virtual reality until we introduce the matrix and people really feel like they're there. <laughs> but until then, you know, the close second is still great, but we also have the first one. So like I said, the big thing is about brand. Apple can keep introducing products of any kind because their brand is more so a lifestyle and a feeling. It's not, if Apple, maybe they couldn't br drop a shoe. But honestly, if they did, I would buy them. Yes. <laughs> if Apple dropped a shoe and had LeBron James collab with him or like whatever athlete is popular, however they did it because they have the best marketing of all time with everything they dropped, it would somehow make sense, possibly. <laughs> Right. But then you have like Samsung. If Samsung dropped the shoe, we're like, nah, because uh -huh. it's just you understand without me having to explain it. They communicate their brand differently. So it's all about brand. Like if your brand is broad lifestyle wise and more of a uh, a feeling than just, hey, we're a sugar, sugary drink company. You know, and we're promoting that versus the feeling. Then you can keep introducing things. And even though like we're not a virtual reality company, we can introduce that because it's still travel, it's still that experience, and people will trust us rather than another company who drops it, even if it's better a little bit. Oh, I love that. You are already thinking about 10, 15, 20 years down the road. You're not just pigeonholing yourself into, we do no. group travel. You're like, yeah, that's just the starting point, though. It's all just a starting point. Like Even right now, like our target audience is single, no children having millennials <laughs> who have working <laughs> income. But, I mean, we eventually, like, want to have family trips, you know, people with kids, married people, um, you know, generation, what's it called, baby boomers. They're about to be, well, they are already retiring in mass numbers with, you know, a lot of money to travel with, mm -hmm. you know. So we want to capitalize on that. That's going to be a huge shift of the economy as they're all starting to stop work. Um so yeah, like how big is your team right now? We've been bringing on a lot of people this month. Um, <laughs> right now we're at we're right under ten, okay. under ten people. Yeah, so we're we're bringing on more people right now. Um, like I said, we have a team of developers. We have a team strictly for travel planning and operations, um, helping out on hosting trips. Um, I have more of a product management team that's overseeing like the not just creation of the app but the overall infrastructure of what we're doing. And then I have a CFO, older gentleman, um, who's been a part of a couple of companies who have already went public and exited. And um, I'm in talks with somebody who I would love to be like a, a, a co-founder on the travel side of things because they also have had um, a company with close to a million in revenue on doing trips similar, but they just didn't necessarily have the other part of the vision that I, I have. But they're, as far as executing trips and hospitality and quality, their shit is just as good as a lot of stuff that I've done. I'm if not curious. Better. I love that. Because we, we've talked about the importance of having a strong team on this podcast before and just how you. There's no way I'm doing any of this shit I'm talking about by myself. <laughs> <laughs> like, not even close. There's, you just can't build an empire alone. No, I think you know? at the end of the day, you as an entrepreneur, you have the vision. You're building the team to execute the vision. That's your job. Yeah. No, 100%, bro. I mean, you, you, you're the same. Like, you're the CEO, and you have four other people in here. Everybody's doing something, and they know exactly what they're doing. As soon as we walked in, she's over there knocking stuff out, <laughs> getting the uh, microphones ready. She's over here checking the mics. Like, mm -hmm. he's over there making sure that I was going to be able to get into the room. So everybody's just on their job and, um, you know, allowing you to be able to have bathroom breaks without stressing out. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a big thing to know um, your vision very clearly so you can communicate it with everybody um, because everybody if everybody's not bought in and you have a lot of people where this is like second or third or fourth priority uh, the energy is not aligned like vibration has to be on the same playing field for everybody involved or if you guys are in different vibrations the vibe is off you know how do you get the how do you make sure that your team is all on the same vibration um well one you gotta be on a hundred like that you can't because any anytime you want to hold people accountable, like you got to be in the field first, you got to be front line, um, ready to die, like before them. But at the same time, you have to know like what you need them all to do. So I don't think it, I'm not comfortable holding people accountable if I'm like bullshitting. So like that's first. Second, I know exactly what I need them to do, um, and I know where we're at in the business. So 
also have a lot of mentors, like people that I have that advise me. So I'm I, I question with them on like, what do you think about this with these people who are, you know, this person's been doing this, this and that. I feel like maybe they made an excuse here. Maybe I'm just overdoing it or overthinking like how hard I should be pushing them. And so I try to get some advisory, but at the same time, like I said, knowing exactly what I need them to do, doing all of my shit plus more, um, because everybody's gonna follow your lead as the leader. And then, um, yeah, if I know exactly what I need them to do, I can hold them accountable to it. And if they're just not doing it, I say fire fast, like communicate fast. Don't wait. If something happens wrong, don't like wait and be like three weeks later, you did something that, you know, annoyed me three weeks ago. No, address it then, you know, respectfully. Uh, what's the word? Document it. So when the time comes and they've done something that is bad for the business three times, like, yo, March 3rd, you accidentally uh, dropped the check and we lost $2,000. Uh, March 25th, we see here that you didn't respond to this email. And so this person did this, this and that. And then over here in April, this happened. So, you know, we, we, we love the time here with you, but we got to, you know, part ways versus just letting resentment grow because you're not communicating or documenting or just treating it like a business. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people say this, but be slow to hire and fast to fire. That's what I hear. So I've been the opposite and I've seen how that worked. So I'm trying a new way. And it's doing pretty good right now. I think we've done a couple of different versions of that. For us, uh, for me, I'm going to talk for myself. Uh, I like hiring kind of fast, but I also like firing faster, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. Like, we might hire, like, three or four persons for the same job and kind of, like, wheel them out who's the right fit for the right. team. So that's kind of the concept we do here. And But, you know, even to your point, like you said, you have somewhat of um, some guidelines like you said, you're putting them through somewhat of a test. Like you already know what stuff you're looking for in that fast period. Um, so yeah, that that happens over time. Yeah, and I don't for this company, I don't make the ultimate decision in a sense. Like I ask their opinions, their opinions, because they actually interact with a lot of people. Right. Or for example, Casey is like, Hey, I'm gonna hire this other producer, you do most of the editing, how you like their workflow, how does that affect you? And then based off their her answer, I make a decision if we're gonna keep them on board or take what, what kind of people do y'all like? <laughs> oh gosh I mean you gotta be ambitious I'm gonna be honest and, and our work is fast paced and we like Jose is um, I have always been someone that people are like oh you move fast Jose moves faster right yeah. so you gotta be willing to come in and every single day there might be a new direction to go and we're running 100 miles an hour so you have to also be self sufficient so mm -hmm. we need to give you a structure but it may not be a lot of structure and I need to know that I can walk away and take 10 meetings and you're still doing your thing or if and you have questions like oh, we're big on ask us questions you're not gonna bother us but I don't want to come back after a whole day and find out that you have just sat and not done anything because you yeah. didn't ask me a question, you know? No, and so, the, yeah, so that's, I think that's the biggest thing for us. We really want people who are willing to speak their mind, yeah. who are willing to say they have a strong opinion about something and here's why. The best advice I ever got is like the perfect employee to hire is the employee is not scared to tell you what to do. 100%. Yeah. So, Steve, Steve Jobs talked about that in a, um, a little interview. He was basically explaining like, you, when you recruit A-list people, that was another thing. Like, I stopped recruiting people that I thought I could get. I started recruiting and trying to get people that, like, I used to be intimidated to try to talk to, who already mm -hmm. had success, who could be potential competitors, who, like, could potentially, on paper, maybe start something that I thought was bigger than what I was doing. Um, so that is another thing. I started recruiting up. Just star like, players. Yeah, star players. So that's, that's one, because some people are not star players yeah. and uh they will drive you crazy and you got people who can talk a good game but back to the point so steve jobs said like you know when you recruit these star players they create an environment of accountability just naturally like you said he's the ceo but you just said what you said which is a ceo's mindset mm -hmm. i don't want to leave here and when i come back i see that you weren't doing that so you knowing that she's thinking that and i'm sure he's thinking that because if she's thinking that then, <laughs> you know, so if he's not doing his job <laughs> And it's just going to make it weird. And so if he's also thinking that and she's the only one out, the environment is going to be way off. And everybody's going to be sending this resentment energy towards her if she doesn't get on board. And so she has one option to get on board and everybody really eventually hate her for fucking 
fucking up the business or she's going to be on point. I'm not saying you're doing that. <laughs> but Casey is but, on point. But no, but, but that's this, true. That's the environment. Like I said, yeah. it's the vibration. Everybody will realize whether they're on or off the vibration and be like, yo, I need to pick up my you know accountability and what I'm doing so I can get back on vibration with everybody. And it can go the opposite way. So uh, I remember my first job out of college. Um, it, when you were the, traveling for free? Yeah, <laughs> after, I was tra- after I was like, oh, it's expensive to travel. Um, it was the kind of environment where I saw people to an extent, be, I think because they were burned out but and there wasn't a good leadership and management style, a lot of people were doing the bare minimum. Yeah. And then a few people Quite and then a few people were doing almost all of the work. And it was falling disproportionately Sounds on like a, a few fun people. job depending on what part of the team yeah, you were on. <laughs> right? And so then I just watched this dynamic and I was like, this is so toxic because you have all this budding resentment over here. Right. You have all these people who didn't feel, and then you go down to it, they didn't feel valued. And so they were kind of doing the bare minimum because they're like, why would I do more? I don't feel like I'm valued. I don't feel like I'm paid enough. I don't feel, yeah. whatever it is, right? And I just saw that and I was like, oh my God, I do not want to work in some place like this. And if I ever had my own thing, I certainly wouldn't want that to be the environment and so that's yeah. what happens if you don't build that culture build that vision was where this a big company already? it was it was small and it had that had been scaling so i think they doubled in size in a year that i was there that, that can happen though. and that's yeah. that's the thing is something else i learned is they put something that happens with startups is you have this team everything's great when you start like you you know chose these players but as you grow these people all of a sudden become managers. Now, here's the thing. Yeah. If you have never been a manager before or you've never like led people, that is a skill in and of itself. Yeah, so just because you have been at the company longest does not necessarily mean you're the best qualified to lead no. or to manage a team. 100%. And these people, it's not their fault, but they were thrust into leadership positions that they weren't prepared for. Yeah. And then it just circles down throughout the whole organization. Mm-hmm. Not even in startups, too. It's like for us, we've been around for 50 years. Um, older companies that have to kind of re-innovate, you kind of feel me? Mm-hmm. Sometimes fall us on the same track. Yeah, anytime yeah. there's new leadership or you're changing up a structure or you're trying to scale to that next level. We talk about all the time that a lot of times the team you start with isn't the team you scale with. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I went through so many teams. It's, it's, I mean, all business is so much trial and error. Um, and so many people say this cliche thing. is like you just, It's literally just a matter of outlasting all the failures. Like, over time, it's you're like, just stepping on every failure as a lesson. And then you realize, like, oh, back then I had no idea. Like Thomas Edison, I don't even believe he the, actually did this. The light bulb thing? Yeah, the <laughs> light bulb. And I think that's complete cap. Conspiracy but theory. He said, <laughs> I think it's complete cap. It's all a legend. Like, people like to boost their legend, right? So when I die, I'll make sure y'all told people, like, just boost everything oh, I actually travel. did. I invented travel. I invented travel and AI, right? <laughs> so just boost everything I actually did. So, like, a thousand years from now, nobody nobody knows the difference. Nobody's going to be like, nobody's going to try to test what you actually did a thousand years from now. They're just going to keep telling the story. But anyway, he said he failed 10,000 times to make the light bulb, which makes him look like just disciplined balls of steel. Like, he just, <laughs> you know, out here working super hard, well, failing. I think the quote's like, I didn't fail 10,000 times. I just found 10,000 times that the light bulb didn't work. Right. But, you know, one person that we do have statistics on doing that is Kobe Bryant. He missed more shots than anybody in NBA history. He also probably took the most shots. Yeah, literally. I mean, so, you know, nobody ever mentions that about Kobe Bryant. We just talk about how he was one of the greatest to ever do it, but it's because he was fearless when it came to potentially missing, aka failing. So I don't know if you feel this state. way, but when you fail, I like when I fail or make a mistake or like do do something, I'm like, oh my god, everyone thinks I'm such an idiot. Ah, da, 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 I'm so awful. And you know what? No, people forget about that so quick. Yeah. You know, as a po- and then they do remember the wins. They remember all of this. So you're putting yourself at this disadvantage. I find if you're like, oh, I, I don't want to mess up. Blah blah blah. Who cares? Learn from yeah, it. I mean, everybody has that. So I'm not going to cap on here and act like nobody's thinking about that. But it's about, I, I look at it like this. Muhammad Ali said, um, I'm not going to sit here and act like I don't care about what people think, but I care more about what people think at the end of my journey than right now. Because you can look back at somebody's life in retrospect and be like, yo, look at all the stuff you did. Nobody is looking at the three mistakes you made when you were 28. Mm -hmm. Like that messed up your small business at the time. They're looking at the huge successes you had, the major pinpoints of your overall timeline. So that's what I think about on a grand scale. Like I look at life in decades and quarter centuries type shit. You know, you're looking at life as in, oh, I'm 23 and this weekend I got drunk and embarrassed myself. It's like, "Mm -hmm, you'll be fine, bro. Like apologize to those people for throwing up on their carpet (laughs) (laughs) and get your shit together. But, um... Yeah, 
what would you say? Because I had one more thing I was going to add to that. Well, no, it was just like that, you know, the whole you you miss all the shots you don't take. You know, yeah. don't let that failure stop you from from going again or that fear of failure. It was it was one thing you were saying about bringing on the people. And I wanted to add to that. Um, just like as far as bringing on people um, and creating that structure, like it's a lot of planning ahead of time Mm -hmm. you know like you said they were they doubled in size overnight almost because they got funding and stuff like that right so i right now only recruit people that i think can be leaders because everybody can potentially like the guy who i have right now is the technical product manager i'm even though his job now he's got it locked as technical product manager I'm essentially interviewing him over this period for CTO. Nice. Which would be the lead for the whole technical division of our company. So, like, I put hella pressure on him. I like to start arguments with him, not really, but, like, somehow to see Mm -hmm. how our communication is under friction. Um, Like, I do that with everybody because if you're the marketing guy right now, you just manage this, you know, the social media and email campaigns. Well, you really could potentially be the CMO of the whole company, the person who runs our number. So everybody can potentially be the leader. And so if you don't start with the end in mind, like you said, you mess around and get that money, which is going back to what we said even earlier, so many people who were getting money when the market was just open and everybody's getting funding, they never had those experiences to fail while recruiting. So they got people that was just look good on paper and got this money. And now they're like, oh shit, none of these people are actually good. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So... You got to start with the end in mind, especially when recruiting. Um, yeah. I think that goes back to mindset. Yeah. I mean, the right mindset. Talk about Kobe Bryant. Um, I remember one of the games I watched um, in the Olympics. He was playing against Paul Gasol. Mm-hmm. And the first play right off the bat. Bumped he, him in the chest. Yeah. Knocked him over. Drive through. He was a savage. Kobe Bryant would have been like a <laughs> barbarian, like, prince ruler of a country back in the, like, 1300s. Gladiator for sure. Yeah, man. He, he was different. He was a genius. Like, you watch those videos. It's like... Um, it's almost like Chuck Norris legend of all the the, the funny clips. It's like one time Kobe Bryant um, looked at the moon and it hurt his eyes. So the next summer he spent all year looking at the sun so he would never get... I'm like, what? But, <laughs> but it's because of the real stories of his insane preparation towards the game that you don't hear anybody else doing. Because you got LeBron James, natural freak of nature, also amazing huge. work ethic. But he had a huge advantage in just being a natural, God-gifted freak. Michael Jordan the same way. Michael Jordan has the hands of like a seven footer with a fifty inch vertical, six six, like ridiculous, uh, natural gifts. Kobe Bryant, similar size as far as height, way smaller hands, um, not as gifted athletically as both of those guys. But work ethic wise, I probably give him the edge over both of them because he was able to catch up off pure hard work. So, shout out to Kobe, man. <laughs> shout out to Kobe. Where can people find you online on socials, you and JetQuest? Um, people can find JetQuest at JetQuest.net. Uh, people can find me on social media at Jonathan Lewis 713 um, Jonathan with an O, J-O-N-A-T-H-O-N. We put the ball with the bouncing ball right there. Um, and then what else? Yeah, like everything is at JetQuest on social medias. Uh, yeah. So That's perfect. What's y'all's long-term goal for this podcast? Jose. Honestly, this podcast, we wanted to... We started off this podcast. The idea came out in November. Um, and me and Emma, we were thinking about our business structure. We said, like, hey, this is how business we're currently doing. We're, we're killing the game and making websites. We're killing the game and creating beautiful content for people to use. Okay. But uh, do we enjoy this? So me and Emma said back one day, we were talking, like, we actually enjoy having great conversation with great people. And our plan is to to create a podcast that we can interview people like yourself that are talented and are making waves in the community, waves in your industry. Um, and we feed off inspiration, right? Mm-hmm. So the plan in the next couple of years is to continue evolving this podcast, creating more into a media company where we can show people different perspectives, different talents, and hopefully inspire people to make a change in the world. So how do y'all plan on using AI to help y'all with that? (laughs) That's her question. Well, we actually, I mean, AI is a tool, right? So there's a lot of different parts of that. We are open about talking about AI, talking about how to use those tools to help you in business. Uh, We really want to be transparent about breaking down barriers. Neither one of us came from traditional business backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have this. We didn't go to business school. We didn't know, like, you know, resources and all of that. And so part of this platform is also 
honestly, being transparent, breaking down the barriers, and sharing that it is, to, if you have the work ethic, like, anyone can yeah, really step up. To build on top of what she's saying with AI for transparency, we launch a uh, special series challenge. And it's like how to start a business with $10,000, right? For me, it's always been, I've been more on the business side of things, not the execution of the talent. For example, I opened up a landscaping company, but I never cut the grass. I own a barbershop. I don't cut hair. Mm -hmm. um, You're saying you did that for real? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so in this business, like when I partnered up with Emma, I didn't really know that much about marketing. Right. I needed it. I wanted to, uh, we worked in a couple of different other startups, so I knew she had the talent and I can help her, you know, corporate structure, create, get the, yeah. Yeah, create the, the infrastructure. So essentially Starting with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. So essentially the challenge is like how to start a business with $10,000 and the first meeting we had, I'm like, okay, realistically, what's the tool people have? If I'm starting from scratch again, I'm using open AI or ChatGPT to actually write a business plan. Right. Because we've been in a room, so we took like mm -hmm. two weeks to create a business plan. But if I have a concept in mind, like how do you actually use this? Okay, how to create a, for a formula. And we're teaching people how to take something like that that comes out and it's, you know, it comes from an idea, how it can put together into something super comprehensive, but it's really generic. And then how do you pull apart you? And yeah. so we're recording all of this just to share how... It's one thing to talk about. Oh, like y'all, do y'all document the process. Y'all documenting exactly. the whole process, not only like the creating the product, but also like, okay, how do we come up with the name? He has this AI generated business plan based on ideas because it's like this is something that's feasible for other people to do. It's yeah. like I'm gonna put my bullet points down. It's gonna generate this, but it's still hella generic. A lot of people overthink AI right now, and it's it's um it's a tool. they just have to get into it. I yeah. got my mom on ChatGPT one day because she kept asking me questions while I was doing something one day. I'm like, mom, like I can't. I was like, you know what? Do you have download this app? So I sent it to her. She downloaded it, and I showed her how to prompt it the correct way to ask a question. She was like, oh my god, this mm -hmm. is crazy. And so now I'll go visit my mom, and she's literally like using ChatGPT instead of Google to search things and stuff like that. So she uses it, but it's it's very like I talk to it. I never even do the type, and I use it on the phone, and. You got to get good. The main thing is you got to get good at the prompting. The prompts. Yeah. Asking questions and including hella detail with what you're trying to get at. Um, and then, like, you can write a book page by page, um, make a movie script page by page or scene by scene um, using ChatGBT and in, and in crazy detail. And now that we have this AI video, you can animate your own movie on top. Like, there's the, the opportunity to make a million, I mean, billion dollar company is closer now than ever the goal is, for the average person yeah, yeah and the goal is to show that not only like this is the concept of what ai could do to you but we're actually showing like okay we had a pivot initially we want to do like a white label system or even a private label mm -hmm. now we're actually creating our own palm made and then we have the recipe for chat gpt then we tried it out we actually pulled my hair out too much beeswax so we had a how do you actually pivot in those in the stressful environments and how do you actually refine the formula mm -hmm. and it's showing people that anybody could do this you just have to have number one the mindset number two the will and don't give up. Just yeah. keep innovating. That's it. No, yeah. I, I like I said, um, it's just you just have to get started. And so many people make excuses for this, just like they did with getting on social media. But we got to realize these tools when they come, you only have such a time span where nobody else is using it or capitalizing. And I think for at least another two years. We're still early. We're very you know? early. In terms of, it's one thing to be playing around with it, but it's another thing to be figuring out Being how to monetize, it, yeah. how to create, and really make, you know, help achieve your goals faster. If you think about the video part of it, I think it was like that a year crazy. ago, it looked like cartoons, now it looks like freaking real people. Yeah. What we have accomplished in a year's. Freaking. Even, even the pictures, like with the pictures, like people would be having like their fingers mixed up and stuff like that in the images that AI would create. Yep. They fixed that already. And now they have videos that look like that show your pores. Like they're so <laughs> clear. You can't even tell other than somebody posting that this is an AI video. Did you know that? You know, like you wouldn't have known if you didn't see that per that part of the post. So, um, yeah, it's it's a crazy jump in just a year. So imagine 10 years from now. Like I said, when they, they introduced the Matrix. I think it's like, it's, don't fight the technology. Learn how to use technology to benefit you at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. No, 100%. And that's our goal. That's what we're doing with the podcast. You know, with we're still obviously going to be involved with our creative agency. We just 
are always, we're not just following the technology, but we're also following our passion. We're following what we genuinely like to do. Because but this is marketing for y'all. Yeah. So I, I, I think y'all need to make sure y'all audience knows that too. Like this is a platform that is going to, like you say, you're already at 4,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like what, three, four weeks? So, I mean, those are all potential clients, people that can refer you guys. Um, that's why I asked if y'all had a product because I know a lot of people who have a product, but you guys have a service. So you, you have something that you're selling and this is, promoting that is marketing it you know so the more you guys get out on that scale like people got to understand that and you could be doing credit you know shout out to my boy Shaquille you know with credit jump solutions you could be doing a skill and just having a podcast where you interview other entrepreneurs and mention how credit or funding has helped their business or you could be selling lemonade but it's about the marketing of it and when you, so if you want to go that detail the quality of this podcast is what we're selling. That's going to be the difference because now everybody does have a podcast. Mm -hmm. You know, like your mom has a podcast nowadays. But that production quality can't touch ours. And we know yeah. that. You know what? And but, we, you know. AI now. <laughs> you know, so like a year and a half ago. We'll have to do an episode that's just AI. <laughs> and see if people can tell the difference. But like just a year and a half ago, AI, like before this AI stuff, you could literally like, there was a huge gap in how you could create something. Like even just simply having captions. Like you needed a... Uh, person who could actually put captions in Adobe for your video. Now, they have an app called Captions that does it for you. Captionator. Wow. You know, like, so, so much part using this technology is breaking down the barriers to entry of winning on a big level, so. And then, at the end of the day, if you can break down those barriers to entry, guess what really stands out? Creativity. You. Storytelling, essence, what's drawing people in. And yeah. so, I think that's, we have that two sides, right? We have the, the production, we also have that creativity and yeah. storytelling. That's going to so. be the, the, the billion-dollar skill set over the next 20 years is, is trying to keep ahead of what AI cannot do, which is, like, the soul of something. And that's going to be the part we've got to dive, dive deep on. And I feel like they're trying to take more and more of that away, the more control that we are being put under with social media and television and the food and just everything that has a... Um, a vibration lowering aspect to it. Um, we got to make sure that we, we you stay above it. Eat good, work out, uh, believe in whatever you believe in at a high level. Go outside, look at the sun, do all these things to raise your vibration so you can stay above, um, just ahead of the technology. Because like if you don't have a soul or if you don't have that that energy, that uh, creative thing that AI can't give, then you you're already behind like in a big big way. I completely agree. Yeah. You know? Ross, thank you so much for coming in and speaking with us today. Like I said, we'll drop all your information down below so anyone who's watching, they can go to JetQuest, check it out, book a group trip, yep. and support. Yeah, we out the country this year, man. We got DR coming up in April, Bali in uh, September, Dubai in August, and we're doing Kenya in October. Uh, so just check out the website, check out the Instagram, social medias, all that. We will see you guys out the country. See you next time.